Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good. 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 That's such an interesting word. Such a broad word, right? What does it mean to be good? What makes something good? What makes this apple good? What makes a car good? What makes a car run well? Is that, is that what makes a car good? If it runs well? Clearly that's not the case because we buy a new car like every five or ten years, regardless of whether or not it's running. It's not necessarily good. What makes a hamburger good? Everything. <laughs> is the beef? Is the beef what makes a hamburger good? Is it the fixings that you put on top? Because I can, with all confidence, say that McDonald's has good hamburgers. I'm sorry, they do. It's like a childhood thing. It just kind of sticks with me. But I love a like, nice gourmet hamburger. What makes something good? What makes a person good? We talk about people, oh, that's a good guy, right? That's a good guy. We like him. Oh, you're such a good girl. He's got himself a good woman. We use that word good a lot. I find good, being good exhausting. Does anybody else find being good exhausting? Some of you are like, yeah, well, all right. Go, preacher. I can listen to this. <laughs> I find being good exhausting because I feel like being good is a moving target. Because if I'm a good husband and a good father and a good employee, guess what happens? I have to keep doing those things. Super annoying. I can't just attain good status and then like keep it. I can't be a good husband and then stop doing what I was doing. To maintain that status, I have to keep doing the things that I was doing before. To be a good employee, you don't get like a certificate after 10 years and like congratulations, unless you're like a tenured professor, then you can stop being good, I guess. (laughs) But like being good, you have to keep trying to be good. It's exhausting and it's a moving target. Because nobody knows what it means to be good. We throw it around. We talk about hamburgers and cars and people using the same word. It's good, right? It's exhausting. What I want us to do today is I want us to talk about how we can be good. How we can be good people. What does it mean to be good? What's the Bible's definition of good? We're going to be in Titus chapter 3, verses 1 to 9. That's where we're going to be today. And we're going to start by looking at what's the opposite of goodness. Then we're going to look at where goodness comes from. And then we're going to land in what that actually looks like in our lives. And our today, our fruit, obviously, is the apple. Because apples are just so very good, right? They're so good. So let's talk about the opposite of goodness. What's the opposite of goodness? Let's look at chapter 3, verse 3. We'll go back and get 1 and 2 later. For we ourselves, Paul's writing to Titus, we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. When we talk about being good, we have different qualifications for being good. Sometimes it's purpose-oriented, sometimes it's ethically driven, sometimes it's based on truth. And what I want to do is, uh, looking at this first verse, I want us to look at all the ways that we actually miss the mark of being good as people. And the first one is that we are mistaken in our purpose. Go back and look at verse 3. For we ourselves were once foolish. We're foolish. Now, in Scripture, foolish doesn't mean just like being dumb or stupid or ignorant. It means being dumb, stupid, and ignorant, particularly in regard to spiritual matters. You don't know what you were created for. You were created for God's glory. You were created to bear his image. You were created to declare the glory of God to the rest of creation. And many of us miss that that as our purpose. We think our purpose is something else. We think our purpose is to be a good employee, to be successful. We think our purpose is to uh, procreate. We think our purpose is to uh, be a good son or a good daughter or a good family member. We think our purpose is to get married. We think our purpose is to acquire things. And the Bible says that when somebody adopts those things as your ultimate purpose in life, it's not good. You're foolish. And we're mistaken about our purpose all the time. For example, let's talk about, again, hamburgers. If you have a hamburger that tastes terrible, but it gets 50 miles to a gallon, somehow you can drive it, it's not a good hamburger. Hamburgers are supposed to taste good. But if you have a car that doesn't run, but tastes like a giant (laughs) M&M, praise God, it doesn't run. It doesn't work. It's not good. It's not doing its purpose. When you are mistaken about your purpose, we lose the ability to be good. So 
So it's strike one. That's one of the ways we miss out on goodness. The second way is in misbehaving. We misbehave in our actions. We misbehave in our actions. Most of the world would say that being good is doing more good things than bad things, right? A good person is defined by their actions, what they do. That's the, the way most of the world works. And if you have more good things outweighing the bad actions you take, then you're overall you're a good person. But it doesn't quite work that simply, does it? It doesn't work quite that easily. Because if I, for example, let's say for 3,650 days, so for 10 years, I give away $20 every single day to somebody in need, you would say I was a good person. Way to go, Travis. Good job. You're a good dude. But if after all that, let's say I wound up, wind up murdering somebody, again, extreme example, but roll with me here. I'm no longer a good person. The one act of evil outweighs the 3,650 good actions I did previously, right? I'm no longer a good person. I'm doing evil. So not only do I have to keep track of the number of good actions versus bad actions, I often also have to make sure that my bad actions are not more significant than the good actions that I take. I can't commit any of the big sins. And again, frankly, that's exhausting. We are not good. There has to be an objective standard of goodness. There has to be something that we can turn to, that we can appeal to, and say, this is what goodness is, sort of the ultimate good, and everything else kind of falls in line behind that, right? And this is who God is. God is good. We just sang it, right? You are good. You are good. Oh, I don't sing, so I'm not a good <laughs> singer. I'm more kind of whimpered there at the end, sorry. <laughs> You're good. God is good. He's the ultimate standard of goodness. And, and that goodness is, is manifold in so many different ways. But particularly for this instance, God's moral character is good. He never does anything wrong ever. And that is his standard for us as well. And frankly, we can't do that. In fact, the Bible tells us that nobody is righteous. No one is righteous, not even one person, which means nobody can do enough good. You can't do enough good to outweigh the bad. And here's why. One bad thing wipes the whole slate out. So we're mistaken in our purpose, which is not good, and we're misbehaving in our actions, which is also not good. But it keeps going. It keeps going. Let's look at verse Three again, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, that's the misbehaving, and led astray. We're led astray. We're misled in what is true. We're misled as to what is true. Now, fun fact about me, I like conspiracy theories. I think they're super fun, which is fun to live in Dallas because JFK assassination, that's pretty, you know, full of uh, conspiracy theory. But my favorite ones are the ones that are either so innocuous or so ridiculous that they really can't be believed. Uh, so what I'm about to say, uh, I don't believe it. So if you're like involved in this conspiracy, please don't come after me or my family. I don't believe it, okay? So apparently, uh, there is a conspiracy theory involving Mattress Firm. Yes, Mattress Firm. Um, in Chicago, there are about 20 or 30 Mattress Firm uh, locations all within about a six or seven block radius of each other. And so somebody using the power of Google Maps has determined that it is impossible for someone to need that many mattresses, even in a city like Chicago. So the theory is that Mattress Firm is a front for a mob-based money laundering scheme. Again, I don't believe it, so don't come after me. Don't put a hit out on me. I'm okay. <laughs> but think about that. Next time you go for a Labor Day or Memorial Day sale at Mattress Firm, you can also pick up uh, you, can, you can think good about yourself. You're helping the mob launder their money. It's great. This is super helpful. I don't believe many conspiracy theories. Frankly, you get more than, I mean, I can't keep a secret, much less anybody else. So come on, let's, conspiracy theories are just so far-fetched. But there's one that I actually believe. There's been a conspiracy going on since the beginning. There's been a conspiracy to mislead you, mislead me, mislead all of creation as to what is actually good. And it's because we have an enemy. Again, I don't find the devil under every rock, but we do have an enemy. His name is Satan, and he is a deceiver. He's a liar. He wants to mislead us as to what is true, what is good. 
So what he does is he convinces you, he convinced Adam, he convinced Eve, he convinces us that what is good is actually bad and what is bad is actually good. And he doesn't do it with everything. That would be too easy to figure out. He only does it with some things. He wants you to believe that God does not have your best interest in mind. In fact, he wants you to believe God doesn't really like you at all and that he's kind of distant from you. He wants you to believe that God does not want a relationship with you. He misleads us as to what the truth is, and we buy it. Now, at this point, a good Southern Baptist preacher would get into like, now we go into like sex, drugs, and rock and roll, right? Because we've been led to believe that those are good things. Blah, blah, blah. No. There are deeper lies that you believe that create problems later on in those other things. What am I talking about? These are heart lies. These are lies that we believe in our heart. How many of you, and again, don't raise your hand. You can raise your hand at home if you want to, but the person on the couch with you is going to see you. How many of you believe that you're a failure? How many of you believe that you get a message regularly that you're a failure? Maybe you've got imposter syndrome. If you don't know what that is, it's when you're sitting in like work or a board table or something, and you're just waiting for everybody else to figure out that you're actually not as good at your job as everybody thinks you are. I've got good news. Everybody around that table is thinking the exact same thing, okay? We believe we're failures. How many of you believe that if somebody really got to know you, they wouldn't love you? Even like your closest friends, your spouse, uh, children, if they really got to know you, they would loathe you and be disgusted by the person that you are. How many of you believe that? That is a lie from Satan. How many of you think that God doesn't actually want anything to do with you? He loves and died for everybody else, but not for you because you're just too gross. These are the lies that we believe, that, that are pumped into us 24-7 from the evil one. We buy it. And I know we buy it because there's a whole bunch of self-help out there that's trying to overcome that stuff. We buy it. And what happens is that then leads to us being the last miss, the last way that we are not good. We're misguided in our passions. Let's look at the text again. For we ourselves were once slaves to various passions and pleasures. So this is where you get into like the sex, drugs, and rock and roll stuff. Because when we believe those lies, you know what happens? We believe enough of them and we believe them so often that we start feeling really bad about ourselves, which totally makes sense. I'm a failure. Nobody loves me. Nobody loves the real me. Nobody wants to be around me. So I want to start feeling good about myself because frankly, I don't want to feel bad about myself all the time. Some of the time, sure, but not all the time. And so I start looking for pleasure. I start looking for joy. I start looking for entertainment and things that might be good normally, but I explore it outside of what God has permitted for me. And I let my passions and my pleasures rule and reign in my life. And these things are intimately connected. There's a, a quote I read this week that when passion is satisfied, we have pleasure. When pleasure is desire, desired, we develop a passion for it. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with passions and pleasures. Nothing at all. It's when we become enslaved to them. It's when they become our identity, our purpose, who we are. That hit that we need. I realized this about myself. Maybe I didn't realize this. Uh, maybe I knew this before. But I realized this last fall in the middle of baseball season. Uh, it, was, it was October. I'm a big baseball fan. My Braves were in the playoffs. And they were playing a team that I felt like they should have beaten rather easily. And they were really struggling. And I was on the edge of my seat every single night. And something that was a passion and a pleasure became bad. Do you know how I knew it was bad? Look back at the text. For we ourselves were once uh, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice. I became angry, frustrated. My team wasn't winning. Envy. I was jealous because the team that they were playing, they'd already won enough. It was my turn. Hated by others and hating one another. I became hateful. It was really terrible to be around. And I know this because my wife told me that she hates baseball season, <laughs> which is 162 games long plus the playoffs. That's a long time to hate something. So we worked on it. I'm doing better. I'm recovering. When you look at the passions and pleasures in your life, are you jealous? Are you malicious? Are you hateful? Do you find yourself reciprocating hate? Look, passions and pleasures are good things, but when they rule our lives, we are misguided. And so you see all the ways that we're not good here. We're mistaken about our purpose. So if I don't know my purpose, then I'm not good. I'm misbehaving. If I'm not doing good things, I'm not good. 
If I'm deceived, I don't know what the truth is, so I'm misled. That's not good. And then I'm misguided by the very things that I'm calling good. I can become too obsessed with them, and then that cannot be good. People, we're not good. I'm sorry. I, I, I want to be encouraging, and we'll get there. But we, we have to come to the conclusion that we are not in and of ourselves good. We cannot generate goodness on our own. And that's one of the consistent themes about the fruit of the Spirit that we've talked about. It does not come from us. It's why it's the fruit of the Spirit. It comes from him. So what do we do? Well, let's talk about where goodness actually comes from. It's the origin of goodness. It's the origin of goodness. And I want to talk about apples real quick. So apples obviously come from what? Trees. Good. Good. All right. Now we're cooking. Seeds. There's seeds inside. Do you know what is inside the apple seed? Cyanide. Yeah. Apple seeds. I appreciate that. What? That was awesome. A little call and response. I get into that. All right. So there's cyanide, a little bit of cyanide inside of every single apple seed. Now, cool fun fact, you have to eat like 200 apples worth, not 200 seeds, but 200 apples worth of seeds to actually like poison yourself. Don't worry if you've accidentally swallowed a seed. You're okay. You're not some spy that's trying to like, you know, not give up any information. So cyanide in the seeds. So how do we get this good, delicious, it's a gala apple, found that out last hour, gala apple from a poisonous seed. Well, if you plant it in the ground and you take care of it, guess what happens? You may not get a gala seed, a gala tree. Do you know why? Apples have to be pollinated from other apple trees. And there's a whole bunch of different kinds of apples out there. Do you know what the most prominent and only native, Amer native uh, apple to America is? It's the crab apple. It's also the most prominent, which means if you plant a little gala apple seed in your backyard and you wait eight to 10 years, it takes a while to grow one, you will probably most likely wind up with a crab apple tree from your delicious gala apple seed. So how do we then grow gala apples, red delicious, um, what's the other ones? There's a bunch, golden delicious. Uh, yeah, my favorite one's the Granny Smith. I like the sour, it's good, tart. How do you get those? You graft them in. You take a branch from the gala tree that you already have and you connect it to a living root system that's a tree, and now all of a sudden you have gala apples. It grows and it spreads. I want you to look to your neighbor, look to a friend on the couch, whatever, and I want you to tell them, I'm a crab apple. I'm a crab apple. It's okay. We can admit it. I'm a crab apple too. In and of ourselves, we are crab apples. We're not good. We're not good. We have to be grafted in. We have to be brought into a living tree, a living root system, and that's exactly what happens in verse Four, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared. So that goodness and loving kindness, those are the two Greek words we talked about last week that we talked about for kindness. Christetes and uh, philanthropos. Same things. God sees our condition. We can't be good in ourselves. We're stuck. We're broken. We can't fix ourselves. And God sees us and he acts. His goodness and loving kindness appears. Let's talk about what this actually is is. Verse 5, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly. Okay, check this out. God sees us. He sees that we are mistaken. He sees that we're misbehaving. He sees that we're misled. He sees that we're misguided. And rather than leaving us in that state, he actually does something about it. It starts with his mercy. It says, according to his own mercy. So it's not based on our works. It's not based on works we do, not works done by us in righteousness. God sees us. He responds to us, even though we can't do anything about it. His grace initiates. And it says, he washes by the washing of regeneration. He washes us away. That idea of regeneration, that's that grafting in. You're a dead branch. He grafts us into the tree by faith. And now we are a part of a living system where we can begin to bear good fruit, good works. And we'll talk about that in a bit. Notice it says again, and renewal of the Holy Spirit. You're a new creation, not a dead stick on the ground. You're now a tree. You're a part of a tree, a fruit-bearing tree. And he gives this to us in overwhelming abundance. Look at verse 6. Who he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified. Justified is a fancy word for being made righteous, which is another way of saying being made righteous. Good. You are given God's goodness. So we don't have a goodness found of our own. It is imported to us, and we are given God's 
supreme goodness, so that being justified by his grace might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So how do you become good? What do you do? Because we just said not done, works done by righteousness. So what do I do? The best way I can describe this, and, and especially for you watching at home, is I want you to think about all the times you've tried to make God happy based on what you do. Based on what you do. And we all fall in this trap. Even people that have followed Christ for, for many years, we still get confused sometimes. We think to ourselves, how do I make God happy? God must be so disappointed in me right now. What you do as a follower of Christ, or, or sorry, as somebody who, who wants to trust Christ for the first time, you look at all the good things that you do and you say, I'm not going to put my trust in those things. I'm going to put my trust in the good that Christ did and the fact that he died for me and the fact that he was resurrected for me. Have you ever been a part of a group project in school? They're the worst. <laughs> the reason why they're the worst is because inevitably there will be somebody in your group that doesn't do any work and they get a good grade on it. We are basically in a cosmic group project with the rest of humanity. And all of us are slackers. We're not going to get a good grade in and of ourselves. But Jesus is our ringer. He's the straight-A student. He's the one who's going to get the good grade. And it's going to apply to all of us. All we have to do is say, well, I want Jesus' work to count for me. And I'm going to trust that by faith, that's what the faith part is, I'm going to trust that his work is going to be accepted despite the fact that my work is not very good at all. That's how you become a Christian. And what happens at that point is you being mistaken about your purpose, now your purpose is, is clear. I need to bear the image of God. I need to give glory to God. He rescued me. He saved me. This is now what I need to go do. My purpose is clear. I can go and fulfill the good purpose that God has for me. Your misbehavior, yeah, it keeps going a little bit, but you now become redeemed. Your misbehavior becomes distasteful. You don't want to continue in it. You're misled. You now can see the lies that Satan tells you. Again, sometimes we still fall into those. Absolutely. But now we know the truth of the gospel. And because we know the truth of the gospel, we are able to combat the lies with truth. We can say, nope, Jesus died for me. I know that he loves me and accepts me. And we're misguided. We get enslaved by our passions and desires. We realize that nothing is sweeter than Jesus Christ. And it's hard to learn. But as we grow in salvation, as we grow in God's goodness, it happens more and more. It's called sanctification. In and of ourselves, we are not good. You are not good, but you can today. Stop trying to be good because, frankly, it is exhausting. I think it's exhausting. And you can allow the goodness of Jesus Christ to stand in for you. All you have to do is turn to him and trust him. Let his work count for you. So now what happens? What happens now? Well, we do good works. Good works have to have something to do with it, right? Now, it doesn't mean that good works save you. They don't. But now the outgrowth that we have, the outgrowth a growth of goodness is good works. We now start producing fruit. Let's look back at verse 8. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things. Now, look at this. So that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to what? Good works. And then look, he describes good works for us. He helps us out. These things are excellent and profitable for people. So good works aren't just anything that makes people feel nice. Good works are something that are profitable and excellent for people. Well, how do we define that? Well, in Scripture, what is excellent and profitable? That are things that bring people closer and closer to Christ, that give glory to God, that make his name great. Those things are excellent and profitable. And so we have to keep an eye out for what those things are. And Paul does us a favor. He tells us what to avoid, and he also tells us what to go after. He tells us what to avoid in verse 9. Verse 9, But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Notice how he says that they're unprofitable and worthless, comparing it to the worthwhile and the profitable from before. So I'm going to lump three of these things together. Three of these things, it says, uh, avoid foolish controversies. I'm going to leave out genealogies for right now, dissensions and quarrels about the law. <clears throat> All of these things have to do with somebody else. Controversies, dissensions, quarrels about the law, quarrels about what's fair, 
always has to do with something else. We love to look at other people. We love to be obsessed with what other people do. It's because we love controversy, frankly. It's why reality TV is so popular. I feel better about myself when I look at the train wreck that is everybody else's life. We're comparative people. It's how we try to determine what is good, right? I'm a good person because I can compare myself to all the people that aren't good people. And this gets you sucked into controversies. It gets you sucked into arguing about what's fair, and it, and it sucks you into dissenting. Because when something's not fair, we whine and complain about it. That's the dissension part. And we want things to be fair, unless, there's a big caveat, we're the ones who are getting to take advantage of the fact that things aren't fair. Then we get frustrated when people want to take that away from us. And Paul says to avoid them. That is not what is worthwhile and profitable. Stop worrying about everybody else. I sound like my dad right now. My dad always told me that. Stop worrying what everybody else is doing. If everybody else jumped off a bridge, would you, right? It's the same principle. Why are we so obsessed with what everybody else is doing? When you look to God for your source of goodness, for your identity, for who you are, you don't have to worry about what everybody else is doing. Paul also mentions genealogies in the passage. Romans, Greeks, they were obsessed with people's bloodlines, where people came from. We are also obsessed with where people come from. We may not took, uh, place it in genealogies, although Ancestry.com is very popular. I think it's 23andMe now is like the big thing. But we're obsessed with race, obsessed with ethnicity. We try to determine what people will do based on their past, where they come from, whether or not they've done the right things. Let me ask you this. If we were to display your past here in front of everyone, for everyone to see, would you want to be judged on that? My guess is no, I wouldn't want to be. That's why I'm very happy that my past is with Christ. Paul's saying, look, stop worrying about so much about everybody else and stop worrying about where everybody else is coming from. In Christ, they are a new creation. So that doesn't mean you forget about the past. It doesn't mean you don't, don't be smart. What it means is Jesus Christ has accepted you despite your past. And so we do the same. Now let's look at what we're supposed to do. What is goodness? What good fruit should we bear? Let's go back to verses 1 and 2. I said we'd go there. We're going to go there. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. Basically, Paul's saying be a good citizen. Be a good citizen. Be somebody who makes the society you live in better. It's hard to do. In a couple weeks, we're going to have an election. I don't know if you knew about that or not. I think it's on the news occasionally they talk about it. And about half of us are going to be happy with what happens, and about half of us are going to be disappointed. And maybe there's another half of us, I know the math doesn't add up, that doesn't feel like there's a good ending either. Either way. We be a good citizen regardless. We submit to those in authority, even if we don't like the person. Part of being a good citizen isn't just trusting that those in charge are going to make society a good place. It's us as believers. And Paul's writing to Cretans. Cretans who lived in Crete, that's where they get the name from. They didn't like the government. They, didn't, they, they were constantly rebellious. It's a command that we need to take to heart as well. We need to be good citizens. Look at verse 2. To speak evil of no one and to avoid quarreling. I know the grammar here is bad, but you need to start speaking good. You need to speak good of other people. One of the ways that I know whether or not my heart is uh, walking with the Lord is what comes out of my mouth, which I think is something that Jesus actually said. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. You can probably judge, especially if you're a verbal person like me, you can tell where you are with the Lord with what comes out of your mouth. Do you speak kindly to people? Do you speak courteously? Do you, do you avoid quarreling? Do you speak evil of no one? When somebody leaves, do you then talk bad about them? What comes out of your mouth? One of the measurements of whether or not our heart has been transformed is what comes out of our mouth. And then there's also good actions. We need to do good as well. To be general, gentle and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. To show perfect courtesy toward all people. What are your actions like? When people are around you, are you a good person to be around? Are you courteous? Are you kind? Are you gentle in your speech? Are you difficult? Are you hard? Do you enjoy being those things? If 
we've been grafted into the tree. And we've left behind being mistaken. We've left behind misbehaving. We've left behind being misguided and misled. Then we'll start bearing good fruit, good apples that are nutritious for people. When they come into our life, when people take a bite out of your life, are they getting the sweetness and the goodness of Jesus Christ? Or are they getting the bitter fruit of a crab apple? Look, stop trying to be good. <laughs> it's exhausting. I'm tired of it myself. You're never going to be good enough. And take that as a liberating passage, like a liberating idea. I'm never going to measure up because I'm always going to be chasing that thing down. But there's one person that you don't ever have to measure up for, and it's Jesus Christ. He did all the measuring up that you need to do. Just accept him. And if you have been a follower of Jesus, like I have for many years, you forget the fact that Jesus has done all the measuring up, all the goodness I need to do. Relax into that. Take a deep breath. Lean into it. And watch as good work manifests itself out of your life as you rest more and more and more in the goodness of your God. It will manifest itself in your life. And you won't be so worried so much as whether or not people are saying, oh, there goes a good guy. There goes a good gal. There goes a good employee, a good student. They will look at your life and they will say, wow, what a good, good God. And you will fulfill your purpose. Let's pray together. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you that despite the fact that we have in so many ways not been good, that you, Lord Jesus, have rescued us. You've redeemed us so that we might do good. You said in your word in Ephesians 2.10, the verse we're memorizing this week, that you've prepared good works beforehand for us to do, that we might walk in them. Lord, each of us have work to do this week. Each person in this room, each person watching online has things to do this week, and I pray that your goodness and your sweetness would manifest itself through what we do and that people may see that the Lord and taste and see that the Lord is good. Thank you for being the good God that you are. And we love you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.